Super Insider. Hawks going to catch a couple of touchdowns. Let's do it. We're going to start this hour with the summer of standoffs. We've got some messes, big names sitting out in big places. And let's start in the biggest city, and that is right here in New York. Jeff, what the actual heck is going on with Hassan Reddick and the Jets? That is a very fine question, and one that I can't give you answers, but I can give you some of the questions surrounding this. For instance, how are we going to see Hassan Reddick on the field for the Jets, if ever at all? Now, right now, he has formally requested a trade from the New York Jets, from general manager Joe Douglas, who immediately publicly responded to say that he will not be trading Hassan Reddick since he has not even stepped on the field for this organization since they gave up a third round pick to acquire him earlier this offseason. There is no end in sight right here. But I will say Hassan Reddick has surrendered over a million dollars in fines so far that will not come his way. I don't see the leverage here. I don't understand it. I also don't understand why the Jets acquired him without a long-term contract in Look, the first place. Look, it is place. a lose-lose yeah. situation. The definition of a lose-lose situation. So, Bart, earlier, and again, I'll remind anyone, Bart is pretty close to the organization. You do their post-game shows and all that, so you know the people involved. L let me just ask you very simply, do you believe he will play for the Jets this season? I do. I think because he doesn't have a leg to stand on, right? He, he understands that the Jets own his rights, and if he does a Le'Veon Bell and holds out, then they're still going to have his, his rights for the next year. You know, he's 29 years old. He's trying to cash in. He deserves a new contract. You talk about one of four players that have over 50 sacks in the last four years. Uh, he's one of them. Uh, they have to get something ironed out because this regime is under tremendous pressure. If they don't win this year and this year goes bad, then everybody in that building is going to lose their job. No, I understand that. But I guess my point is you've got, you've got him. He's on one side. The, the thing has gotten personal. I yeah. mean, right when, when, the, when the organization releases a statement immediately, right. as Jeff pointed out, this thing has gone beyond business and has become personal, yeah. and that's an ugly place to be. Yeah, they're not, they're, they're not going to get bullied, and they say if he wants to talk about a new contract, he has to come to the building. He's yet to do that. Um, you know, these fines go over a $700,000 a game once the season starts. That's usually when things get ironed out. Deadlines, breeze, action. All right, we'll see if that winds up working out here. Jeff, let's go to the next one. Our next summer standoff is in San Francisco. Brandon Ayuk and the 49ers. This thing has been like a roller coaster. Where are we now on the possibility of him being traded? Well, just like Reddick, this is a complicated one because you need to find a team to, if you're going to go ahead and make this trade, you need to find a team that's willing to give up the draft compensation. The 49ers have gone out and found multiple teams willing to give up that compensation. You also have to find the same team willing to pay Brandon Ayuk what he wants to get paid. There have been teams that have come forward with very, very lucrative offers. And still no deal yet. Ayuk still doesn't like those offers. This is not true free agency. Something's going to have to give here. I still think it is a possibility that Brandon Ayuk plays in a 49ers uniform this coming season. All right, and he's a critical player, Hawk. We talked earlier about his importance. Uh, to the, the way that Jeff is describing it, he's trying to have his cake and eat it too. I support every player getting paid every penny that he possibly can. But the situation he is in he is probably going to have to be willing to accept something less than what he would describe as the ideal outcome unless he stays in San Francisco, plays it out, and then becomes a true free agent next year. How do you see it, Hawk? Yeah, and, and honestly, that might be the best version of, quote, unquote, getting his money, Greeny, because you can't look at it just like, hey, I need all the money I can right now, because I can promise you, if you go to an offensive coordinator that is not as good as Kyle Shanahan or in that system, you will sign for less money the following contract. The best way to get the most money for the foreseeable future is to sign this deal with Kyle Shanahan, if that's your best offer on the table, and then read it up again because you know you'll have that product production. Kyle Shanahan creates career years. Continue that to continue to get your money. All right, and, and maybe win a Super Bowl along the way. We'll see how that one gets resolved. And then the idea, Jeff, that there has not yet been resolution on the C.D. Lamb situation confuses practically everyone. Has there been any movement on that that we're aware of? Quite frankly, the answer is no. And we talk about player empowerment and who has the most leverage. In Hassan Reddick's situation, it feels like very little, if any. In Brandon Ayuk's situation, not much there in terms of leverage either. In this situation, it feels like C.D. Lamb does have the leverage. He is such a productive, important part to a team that really has nobody even close behind him at the position. 
and still we wait for this deal to get done. Jerry Jones one week says there's no urgency, then he backtracks and says that, by the way, there's very much a need to get CeeDee Lamb on this roster, but still no deal in place, still nothing imminent at this very moment. Well, it's not just us talking about it. The most legendary of the former Cowboys, Emmett Smith, was on the Blogging the Boys podcast, and he was talking about how this holdout could impact the quarterback. Without him on the football field, they putting all the pressure on Dak Prescott now. And that is unacceptable because every quarterback of his caliber should have quality people to throw the ball to. Not no plan B or no plan C or no plan D guy. He should be in a position as your franchise quarterback, he should be in a position to be successful. And right now you're putting him behind the eight ball. And that is not right. And that's how I see it. I got to tell you, this the second time this morning I've watched it, and it really is jarring because knowing Emmett, as we all do, and, 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 and as you do too, if, even if you've never met him in person, he's been such an omnipresent figure in, in every sports fan's life forever. He's generally so easygoing that to see him this level of frustrated and angry at the organization, that sort of jumped out at me. Hawk, how, how do you see it, and how do you see the situation with C.D. Lamb? I understand the frustration from Emmitt Smith because we were told that there was an all-in year for the Dallas Cowboys and cancel the fact whatever about the draft, the free agency, the spending, the getting deals done in the offseason, you are at the point now where it is critical. The season is here, and C.D. Lamb is the most important piece to your offense outside of your quarterback. Without him, none of this works. This offense doesn't work, which makes, which makes McCarthy vulnerable. The, uh, it makes Dak vulnerable because the option that he needs from a playmaking perspective in this West Coast offense isn't there, and so on and so forth. So he's absolutely right. C.D. Lamb has done what he's supposed to do in his first couple of years in the league. Hawkeye. He was watching rookie quarterbacks making their preseason debuts. He's now going to tell us what his eyes saw. Hawk, what caught your eye from Jaden Daniels of Washington against the Jets? Jaden Daniels took what he was given and made the most of it. We know what he brings to the table. He's a thrower and he can run. He didn't have a lot of action, but in his opportunities, he made great passes. The deep ball was one of the prettiest of the, the first couple of weeks of preseason. And then when they got in the red zone, he put his legs on full display. I think they have something special in Washington. He looks really good. How about J.J. McCarthy? What did you see from him in Minnesota? I love what I saw in J.J. J.J. got better as the game progressed. Early on, he had some jitters, but the more plays that came, he started to have a really good handle on the offense. He actually looked great in Kevin O'Connell's offense, and I think he's going to end up being the day one starter because of what he's displaying so far. Mm, that's interesting. I've heard good things about Sam Darnold's camp there. That's going to be an interesting one to watch. Finally, uh, Chicago, Caleb Williams. What did your eyes see in the number one pick? It saw that we should check his birth certificate because there's no <laughs> way he should have that veteran type presence and feel on his first NFL game in the preseason. Now, look, when you're watching preseason football, a stat line will not tell you how good or bad a quarterback is. But when you're watching their process, that's what will give you indicators of what you have. And in Caleb Williams, you have something special. You have a guy that can get to reach three and four and beyond. That's rare for any quarterback, let alone a quarterback fresh out of college. All right, so I'm going to make an acknowledgement here, okay? So I promised mm -hmm. last year, after Kenny Pickett looked so good in the preseason, <laughs> and I came on the air and said, oh, the Steelers have found their guy. He's going to be great. I promised I would never overreact to anything I saw in the preseason again. And I'm going back on it <laughs> after one game. <laughs> one game. Caleb Williams is him. He is that guy. Doesn't mean he's not going to have bad moments. All rookies right. do. But he is everything they said he was going to be. I mean, we talked about the rookie quarterback coming into the best situation. He has a veteran offensive line, an improved offensive line. He has weapons on every level. You look right there, that's, that's an easy pass to Swift right there. He's a guy that runs over 1,000 yards. And on the outside, he had veteran route runners. He had guys that can run intermediate routes, and he has a plethora of um, good tight ends as well. Right here, this is running all, you know, on the run, accuracy. What I liked and uh, was impressed with the most was his poise in the pocket. You know, when you saw the, the, the pocket break down, he didn't put his eyes down. He kept his eyes up, used his legs when he needed to, and smartly got down. Jeff, what are you hearing out of there? I, I, I have some connections in Chicago just personally and professionally. Everyone is raving about the stuff even that we don't get to see on the field. Yes. What are you hearing? You know, it, what's funny, and, and this is not 
obviously always the case. I'm not saying that there was this big concern that Caleb Williams would be a bust, but I think that there's still a little bit of like everybody can take a breath and be like, okay, no, no, that's what we thought we were going to see. To your point, we've seen that before from players and they ended up not doing that well. But it is very clear based on that performance, we're not talking about a bust here. We are talking about a very, very capable NFL quarterback. Yeah, look, I mean, the, 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 the history always tells us that the quarterbacks drafted in the first round, you're a 50-50 shot. Right. Let's just look at the top two guys. There was all this debate before the draft. Caleb, Jaden, Jaden, Caleb. Yep. So far, so good. It's one preseason game. So many circumstances mm -hmm. will dictate where they go from here. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's easy to say so far, so good. You see the stuff in both of them, Bart, that yeah. got them drafted where they were. It's such a unique situation when you think about Caleb because they had another team's, another bad team's pick. Right. So they are able to put him on a good roster, a team that finished strong, and then because he's cheap, Cheap, they're able to go out and get veterans like Kenan Allen, who I think is a one-year rental, but put veterans around him so that they don't mess him up. This is a much different situation than what Justin Fields found himself within. So, you know, the fact that he goes into a great situation, probably the best situation since, you know, Patrick Mahomes going into a, a great situation with a play caller that kind of understands what he has in the, in the player. Ironically, I, the, the Bears passed on the opportunity to draft Patrick Mahomes once upon a time. I will say this also, Hawk, I don't know that it's reasonable to yeah. count his success by wins. The back half of the Bears' schedule yeah, is so brutal. I mean, it is, it is a murderer's row. They play the entire division. All those teams are good. That's six tough games. Plus, they have, I think, Kansas City in that stretch or San Francisco. We looked it up on radio yesterday. A, Hawk, a brutally tough schedule. So it might not be the right the right way to assess him might not be by how many games they win this year. No, and, and, and that's the point. Even in the preseason, like we're not assessing them based on the stat line or, you know, what the score of this game was. We're using our eyes and we're using our common sense. Remember watching Joe Burrow very early in his career before they started stacking up wins. It was very apparent that he was an incredible NFL quarterback in the making. The same is to be said for Caleb Williams. Just when you watch him, when I talk about getting to that third or fourth read it's not an intellectual or a brain thing it's a vein thing it is that poise it is that hey in the midst of pressure in the midst of you know chaos all around me I still look like I'm the player out of the 22 on this field that is in control that's what we saw Caleb Williams and when you hit that stretch of the season that still will be what we're looking for